Chapter 4 Eight beds, dinosaurs, and napping with half a brain. Who sleeps? How do we sleep? And how much? Who sleeps? When did life start sleeping? Perhaps sleep emerged with the great apes. Maybe earlier in reptiles or their aquatic antecedents, fish. Short of a time capsule, the best way to answer this question comes from studying sleep across different fell of the animal kingdom from the prehistoric to the evolutionary recent. Investigations of this kind provide a powerful ability to peer far back in the historical record and estimate the moment when sleep first graced the planet. As the geneticist Theodos Dobzhansky once said, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. For sleep, the illuminating answer turned out to be far earlier than anyone anticipated and far more profound in ramification. Without exception, every animal spe species studied to date sleep or engages in something remarkably like it, this includes insects such as flies, bees, cockroaches, and scorpions. Fish from small, small perch to the largest sharks, amphibians such as frogs and reptiles such as turtles, komodo dragons, and chameleons, all have bona fide sleep. As in the, evo the evolutionary ladder, further and we find that all types of birds and mammals sleep, from shrews to parrots, kangaroos, polar bears, bats, and of course we humans. Sleep is universal. Even invertebrates such as primordial mollusks and echinoderms and even very primitive forms enjoy periods of slumber. In these phases, Affectionately termed lethargus, they, like humans, become unresponsive to external stimuli. stimuli. And just as we fall asleep faster and sleep more soundly when sleep deprived, so too do worms, defined by their degree of insensitivity to prods from experimenters. How old does this make sleep? Worms emerged during the Cambrian explosion, at least 500 million years ago. That is, worms and sleep by association predate all vertebrate life. This includes dinosaurs, which, by inference, are likely to have slept. Imagine Diplodocuses and Triceratopsis all all comfortably settling in for a night of full repose. Regress evolutionary times still further and we have discovered that the very simplest forms of unicellular organisms that survive for periods exceeding 24 hours, such as bacteria, have active and passive phases that correspond to the light-dark cycle of our planet. It is a pattern that we now believe to be the precursor of our own circadian rhythm and with it wake and sleep. Many of the explanations for why we sleep circle around a common and perhaps erroneous idea. Sleep is the state we must enter in order to fix that which has been upset by wake. But what if we turn these arguments on its head? What if sleep is so useful, so physiologically beneficial to every aspect of our being, that the real question is, why did life ever bother to wake up? Considering how biologically dam damaging the state of wakefulness can often be, that is the true evolutionary puzzle here, not sleep. Adopt this perspective and we can pose a very different theory. Sleep was the first state of life on this planet, and it was from sleep that wakefulness emerged. It may be 
a preposterous hypothesis that and one that nobody is taken seriously or exploring but personally i do not think it to be entirely unreasonable whichever of these two theories is true what we know what we know for certain is that sleep is of ancient origin it appeared with the very earliest forms of planetary life like other rudimentary feeders such as dna sleep has remained a common bond unit in every creator in the animal kingdom a long lasting commonality yes however there are truly remarkable differences in sleep from one species to another four such differences in fact One of these things is not like the other. Elephants need half as much sleep as humans, requiring just 4 hours of slumber each day. Tigers and lions devour 15 hours of daily sleep. The brown bat outperforms all other mammals, being awake for just 5 hours each day while sleeping 19 hours. Total amount of time is one of the most conceptuous differences in how organisms sleep. You'd imagine the reason for such clear-cut variation in sleep need is obvious. It isn't. None of the likely contenders, body size, prey predator status, diurnal, nocturnal, usefully explains the difference in sleep need across species. Surely, sleep time is at least similar within any one phylogenetic genetic category since they share much of their genetic code. It is certainly true for other basic traits within phyla such as sensory capabilities, methods of reproduction and even degrees of intelligence. Yet, sleep violates this reliable pattern. Squirrels and degus are part of the same family group, rodents. Yet, they could not be more dissimilar in sleep need. The former sleep twice as long as the latter. 15.9 hours for the squirrel versus 7.7 .7 hours for the dego. Conversely, you can find near uh, identical sleep times in neutrally different family groups. The humble genia pig and the precocious baboon, for example, which are of markedly different phylogenetic orders, not to mention physical sizes, sleep precisely the same amount, 9.4 hours. So what does explain the difference in sleep time and perhaps need from species to species or even within a genetically similar order? We're not entirely sure. The relationship between the size of the nervous system, the complexity of the nervous system, and body and total body mass appears to be a somewhat meaningful predictor with increasing brain complexity relative to body size resulting in greater and in greater sleep amounts. While we cannot entirely consistent, this relationship suggests that one evolutionary function that demands more sleep is the need to, ser to service an increasingly complex nervous system. As millennia unfolded, and the evolution crowded its current accomplishment with the genesis of the brain, the demand for sleep only increased, tending to the needs of this most of all physiological apparatus. Yet, this is not the whole story, not by a good measure. Numerous species divide wildly from the predictions made by this rule. For example, an opossum, which weighs almost the same as a rat, sleeps 50% longer, clocking an average of 18 hours each day. The opossum is just one hour shy of the animal kingdom record for sleep amounts currently held by the brown bat, who, as previously mentioned, racks up a whopping 19 hours of sleep each day.
There was a moment in research history when scientists wondered if the measure of child's total minutes of sleep was the wrong way of looking at this of the question of why sleep varies so considerably across species. Instead, they suspected that assessing sleep quality rather than quantity time would shed some light on the mystery. That is, species with superior quality of sleep should be able to accomplish all they need in a shorter time, and vice versa. It was a great idea, with the exception that if anything we've discovered the opposite relationship, those that sleep more have deeper, higher quality sleep. In truth, the way quality is commonly assessed in these investigations, degree of unresponsiveness to the outside world and the continuity of sleep is probably a poor index of the real biological measure of sleep quality. One that we cannot yet obtain in all this quantity and quality across the animal kingdom will likely explain what currently appears to be an incomprehensible map of sleep time differences. For now, our most accurate estimates of why different species need different sleep amounts involves a complex hybrid of factors such as dietary types, omnivore, herbivore, carnivore, predator, prey balance within a habitat, the presence and nature of a social network, metabolic rate, and nervous system complexity. To me, this speaks to the fact that sleep has likely been shaped by numerous forces along the, along the evolutionary path and involves a delicate balancing act between meeting the demands of waking survival. For example, hunting prey and obtaining food in as short a, as short a time as possible, minimizing energy expenditure and threat risk. Serving the restorative physiological needs of an organism, for example, a higher metabolic rate requires greater cleanup efforts during sleep. Intending to the more general requirements of the organism's community. Nevertheless, even our most sophisticated predictive equation remain unable to explain far flung flounder outliers in the map of slumber, species that sleep much, for example bats, and those that sleep later, for example giraffes, which sleep for just four to five hours. Far from being a nuisance, I feel these anomalous spe species may hold some of the keys to unlocking the puzzle of sleep need. They remain a, de a delightfully frustrating opportunity for those of us trying to crack the code of sleep across the animal kingdom and within that code perhaps as yet undiscovered benefits of sleep we never thought possible to dream or not to dream another remarkable difference in sleep across species and composition not all species species experience all stages of sleep every species in which we can measure sleep stages experiences and dream sleep the non dreaming stage however insects amphibians fish and most reptiles show no clear signs of dream sleep the type associated with dreaming in humans only birds and mammals, which appeared later in the evolutionary timeline of the animal kingdom, have full-blown REM sleep. It suggests that dream, REM sleep is the new kit on the evolutionary block REM sleep block. REM sleep seems to have emerged to support functions that unREM sleep alone could not accomplish or that REM sleep was more efficient at accomplishing yet as we yet as with so many things in sleep there is another anomaly i said that all mammals have rain sleep but debates around cetaceans or aquatic mammals 
Certain of these ocean fairing spe species, such as dolphins and killer whales, bug the ruined slave trending mammals. They don't have any. Although there is one case in 1969 suggesting that a pilot whale was in rim sleep for six minutes, most of our assessments to date that have not discovered rim sleep, or at least what many sleep scientists would believe to be true rim sleep in aquatic mammals. From one perspective, this makes sense. When an organism enters REM sleep, the brain paralyzes the body, turning it limp and immobile. Swimming, swimming is vital for aquatic mammals, since they must surface to breathe. If full paralysis was to take hold during sleep, they could not swim and would drown. The mystery deepens when we consider pinnipeds one of my all-time favorite words from the Latin derivative pina, fin, and pedis, foot, such as four seals. Partially, aquatic mammals, they split their time between land and sea. When on land, they have both end rim sleep and rim sleep, just like humans and all other terrestrial mammals and birds. But when they enter the ocean, they stop having rim sleep almost entirely. Seals in the ocean will sample, but a substance of the stuff racking up just 5 to 10 percent of the rim sleep amounts they would normally enjoy when on land. Up to two weeks of ocean bound time have been documented without any observable rim sleep in seals who survive in such times on a zone tides of unrim sleep. These anomalies do not necessarily challenge the usefulness of REM sleep. Without doubts, REM sleep and even dreaming appears to be highly useful and adaptive in those species that have it, as we shall see in part 3 of the book. That REM sleep returns when these animals return to land, rather being done away with entirely affirms this. It is simply that REM sleep does not appear to be feasible or needed by aquatic mammals when in the ocean. During that time, we assume that they make, they make do with lowly and REM sleep, which for dolphins and whales may always be the case. Personally, I don't believe aquatic mammals, even cessatins, like dolphins and whales have a total absence of REM sleep, though several of my scientific colleagues will tell you I'm wrong. Instead, I think the form of REM sleep these mammals obtain in the ocean is somewhat different and harder to detect. Be it brief in nature, occurring at times when we have not been able to observe it or express it in ways or hiding in parts of the brain that we have not yet been able to measure. In, def in defense of my contrarian point of view, I, not, I note that it was once believed that egg-laying mammals, monotremes, such as the spiny anteater and the duck-billed platypus, did not have rim sleep. It turned out that they do, or at least a version of it, the outer surface of their brain, the cortex, from which most scientists measure sleep in brain waves, does not exhibit the choppy chaotic characteristics of REM sleep activity. But when scientists looked at a little deeper, beautiful bursts of REM sleep electrical brainwave activity were found at the base of the brain, waves that are a perfect match for those seen in all other mammals. If anything, the dark build Platypus generates more of this kind of electrical REM sleep activity than any other mammal. So they did have REM sleep after all, or at least a better version of it, first rolled out in these more evolutionarily ancient mammals. 
a fully operational whole brain version of REM sleep appears to have been introdu introduced in more developed mammals that later evolved. I believe a similar story of atypical but nevertheless present REM sleep will ultimately be observed in dolphins and whales and seals when in the ocean. After all, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. More intriguing than the poverty of REM sleep in this aquatic corner of the mammalian kingdom is the fact that birds and mammals evolved separately. REM sleep may thereafter have been birthed twice in the course of evolution. Once for birds and once for mammals, a common evolutionary pressure may still have created REM sleep in both, in the same way that eyes have evolved separately and independently numerous times across different fila throughout evolution for the common purpose of visual perception. When a theme repeats in evolution and independently across unrelated lineages, it often signals a fundamental need. However, a very recent report has suggested that a proto form of REM sleep exists in an Australian lizard, which, in terms of the evolutionary timeline, predates the emergence of birds and mammals. If this finding is replicated, it would suggest that the original seed of REM sleep was present, present at least 100 million years earlier than our original estimates. This common seed in certain reptiles may have then germinated into the full form of REM sleep we now see in birds and mammals, including humans. Regardless of when true REM sleep emerged in evolution, we are fast discovering why REM sleep dreaming came into being what vital needs it supports in the warm-blooded world of birds and mammals. For example, cardiovascular health, emotional restoration, memory association, creativity, body temperature regulation, and whether other species dream as we will later discuss, it seems they do. Setting aside the issue of whether all mammals have REM sleep, an uncontested fact is this. On REM sleep was the first to appear in evolution. It is the original form that sleep took when stepping out from behind evolution's creative curtain a true pioneer. The, this seniority loads to another intriguing question and one that I get asked in almost every public lecture I give. Which type of sleep and REM or REM sleep is more important? Which do we really need? There are many ways you can define importance or need, and thus numerous ways of answering the question, but perhaps the simplest recipe is to take an organism that has both sleep types, bird or mammal, and keep it awake all night and throughout the subsequent day. And REM and REM sleep are thus similarly removed, creating the conditions of equivalent hunger for each sleep stage. The question is, which type of sleep will the brain fist on when you offer it the chance to consume both during a recovery night? And REM and REM sleep in equal pro uh, proportions? or more of one than the other, suggesting greater importance of the sleep stage that dominates. This experiment has now been performed many times on numerous species of birds and mammals, humans included. There are two clear outcomes. First, and of later surprise, sleep duration is far longer on the recovery nights, 10 or even 12 hours in humans, then on a certain standard nights without prior deprivation, 8 hours for us. Responding to the depth, we are essentially trying to sleep it off, the technical term for which is a sleep rebound. Second, and when sleep rebounds harder, the brain will consume a far larger proportion 
of deep and wind sleep than of wind sleep on the first nights after total sleep, the privation expressed in a lopsided hunger. Despite both sleep types being an offer at the finger buffet of recovery sleep, the brain opts to help much more deep and wind sleep onto its plate. In the battle of importance, and wind sleep therefore wins, or does it? Not quite. Should you keep recording sleep across a second, third, and even fourth recovery nights, there is a several. Now REM sleep becomes the primary dish of choice with each return and visit to the recovery buffet table with a side of REM sleep added. Both sleep stages are therefore essential. We try to recover one and REM a little sooner than the other REM, but make no mistake. The brain will attempt to wake up both, trying to salvage some of the losses incurred. It is important to note, however, that regardless of the amount of recovery opportunity, the brain never comes close to getting back all the sleep he has lost. This is true for total sleep time, just as it is for NREM sleep and for REM sleep, that humans and all other species can never sleep back that which we have previously lost in one of the most important take-homes of this book, the sudden and consequences of which I will describe in chapters 7 and 8. If only humans could. A third striking difference in sleep across the animal kingdom is the way in which we all do it. Here the diversity is remarkable and in some cases almost impossible to believe. Take citizens such as dolphins and whales for example. Their sleep of which there is only an rim can be unihemispheric, meaning they will sleep with half a brain at a time. One half of the brain must always stay awake to maintain life necessary movements in the aquatic environments, but the other half of the brain will at times fall into the most beautiful and dream sleep. Deep, powerful, rhythmic and slow brain waves will drench the entirety of one cerebral hemisphere. Yet, the other half of the cerebrum will be bristling with frenetic, fast brainwave activity, fully awake. This despite the fact that both hemispheres are heavily wired together with thick criss-cross fibers and see mere millimeters apart as in human brains. Of course, both halves of the dolphin brain can be and frequently are, awake at the very same time, operating in unison. unison. But when it is time for sleep, the two sides of the brain can uncouple and operate independently, one side remaining awake while the other side snoozes away. After this one half of the brain has consumed its fill of sleep, they switch, allowing the previously vigilant half of the brain to enjoy a well-earned period of deep and lean slumber. Even with half of the brain asleep, dolphins can achieve an impressive level of movement and even some vocalized communication. The neural, engineering and tricky architecture required to accomplish this staggering trick of oppositional lights on, lights off brain activity is rare. Surely, Mother Nature could have found a way to avoid sleep entirely under the extreme pressure of non-stop 24 per 7 aquatic movements. Would that not have been easier than masterminding a convoluted split shift system between brain halves for sleep while still allowing for a joint operating system where both sides unit when awake? Apparently not. Sleep is of such vital necessity that no matter what the evolutionary demands of an organism, when the unyielding need to swim in permanent 
from birth to death, Mother Nature had no choice. Sleep with both sides of the brain or sleep with just one side and then switch. Both are possible, but sleep you must. Sleep is non-negotiable. The gift of split brain, deep and rim sleep is not entirely unique to aquatic mammals. Birds can do it too. However, there is a somewhat different, though equally life perceiving reason. It allows them to keep an eye on things quite literally. When birds are alone, one half of the brain and its corresponding opposite side are must stay awake. Maintaining vigilance to environmental threats as it does so, the other eye closes, allowing its re- uh, corresponding half of the brain to sleep. Things get even more interesting when birds group together. In some species, many of the birds in a flock will sleep with both halves of the brain and at the same time. How do they remain safe from threat? The answer is truly ingenious. The flock will first line up in a row, with the uh, exception of the birds at each end of the line. The rest of the group will allow both halves of the brain indulge in sleep. Those at the far left and right ends of the row aren't so lucky. They will enter deep sleep with just one half of the brain, opposing in each, leaving the corresponding left and right eye of each bird wide open. In doing so, they provide full panoramic detection for the entire group, maximizing the total number of brain halves that can sleep within the flock. At some point, the two end wards will stand up, rotate 180 degrees, and sit back down, allowing the other side to, of their respective brains to enter deep sleep. We mirror humans and a select number of other terrestrial mammals appear to be far less skilled than birds and aquatic mammals, unable as we are to take our medicine of aneurysm sleep in half-brain measure, or are we? Two recently published reports suggest humans have a very mild version of uni-hemispheric sleep, one that is drawn out for similar reasons. If you compare the electrical depth of the deep and rim slow brain waves on one half of someone's head relative to the other when they are sleeping at home, they are about the same. But if you bring that person into a sleep laboratory or take them to a hotel, both of which are unfamiliar sleep environments, one half of the brain sleeps a little lighter than the other, as if it's standing guard with just a tad more vigilance due to the potentially less safe context that the conscious brain has registered while awake. The more nights an individual sleeps in the new location, the more similar the sleep is in each half of the brain. It is perhaps the reason why so many of us sleep so poorly the first night in a hotel room. The phenomenon, however, doesn't come close to the complete division between full wakefulness and truly deep and rim sleep achieved by each side of birds and dolphins' brains. Humans always have to sleep with both halves of our brain in some state of unreal sleep. Imagine, though, the possibilities that would become available if only we could rest our brains one half at a time. I should note that REM sleep is strangely immune to being split across sides of the brain. No matter who you are, all birds respective for the environmental situation always sleep with both halves of the brain during REM sleep. The same is true for every species that experiences REM sleep humans included, wherever the functions of REM sleep dreaming, and there appear to be many, they require participation of both sides of the brain at the same time and to an equal degree. Under pressure, 
The fourth and final difference in sleep across the animal kingdom is the way in which sleep patterns can be diminished under rare and very special circumstances, something that the U.S. Gov uh, government sees as a matter of national security and has spent sizable ta taxpayer dollars investigating. The infrequent situation happens only in response to extreme environmental pressures or challenges. Starvation is one example. Place an organism under conditions of severe famine and foraging for food will supersede sleep. Nourishment will, for a time, push aside the need for sleep, though it cannot be sustained for long. Starve a fly and it will stay awake longer, demonstrating a pattern of food-seeking behavior. The same is true for humans. Individuals who are deliberately fasting will sleep less as the brain is tricked into thinking that food has suddenly become scarce. Another rare example is the, the joint sleep deprivation that occurs in female killer whales and their newborn calf. Female killer whales ha female killer whales give birth to a single calf once every three to eight years. Calving normally takes place away from the other members of the pod. This leaves the newborn calf incredibly vulnerable during the initial weeks of life, especially during the return to the pod as it swims beside its mother. Up to 50% of all new calves are killed during this journey home. It is so dangerous, in fact, that neither mother nor calf appear to sleep while in transit. No mother-calf pair that scientists have observed show signs of robust sleep en route. This is especially surprising in the calf, since the highest demand and consumption of sleep in every other living speci species is the, in the first days and weeks of life. As any new parent will tell you, such is the egregious peril of long-range ocean travel that these infants whales will reverse an otherwise universal sleep trend. Yet, the most incredible feat of delib deliberate sleep deprivation belongs to that of birds during transoceanic migration. During this climate driving race across thousands of miles, entire flocks will fly for many more hours than in is normal. As a result, they lose much of the stationary opportunity for plentiful sleep. But even here, the brain has found an ingenious way to obtain sleep. In flight, migration, migrating birds will grab remarkably brief periods of sleep lasting only seconds in duration. These ultra-power naps are just sufficient to avert the ruinous brain and body deficits that would otherwise ensue from prolonged total sleep deprivation. If you're wondering, humans have no such similar ability. The white crowned sparrow is perhaps the most astonishing example of a vain sleep deprivation during long distance flights. This small quotidian bird is capable of a spe spectacular feat that the American military has spent millions of research dollars studying. The sparrow has an unparalleled, though time limited, resilience to total sleep deprivation, one that we humans could never withstand. If you sleep deprived the sparrow in the laboratory during the migratory period of the year when it would otherwise be in flight, it suffers virtually no ill effects whatsoever. However, depriving the same sparrow of the same amount of sleep outside this migratory time window inflicts a male storm of brain and body dysfunction. This humble passerine bird has evolved an extraordinary biological cloak for of resilience to total sleep deprivation.
one that is deploys only during a time of great survival necessity. You can now imagine why the US government continues to have a vested interest in discovering exactly that what that biological suit of armor is, their hope for developing a 24-hour soldier.